All right, Dan, the Sox are 16 and 13 after taking two out of three against the Chicago Cubs this last weekend. Now five, three and one in series this year. And Dan, just imagine telling somebody that and then also adding, hey, you're going to have to be hit with so many injuries as they have this year. Tristan Casas on the 60 day IL, no Trevor Story, no Lucas Giolito, three other starters on the injured list as well. And yet somehow they're going to end this March, April stretch with a winning record. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a crazy story. And the fact that, you know, as we talk, they sit in third place in the American League East is really remarkable with what they went through from day one of training camp, uh, basically all the way through. And then the injuries just started to pile up. And it's just every time you turn, it gets worse. You know, and it's just like when you start to see a little bit of light, Costas goes down. So you're, just, you're dealing with all these players. They, they are going to get some back. You know, they got Devers back and, and Grissom's supposed to be back, which is good news. But it's just... It's, it's really a remarkable story that I think, you know, they deserve some credit. Everyone in that organization, everyone that's playing out on the field, everyone in the coaching staff, they deserve big time props for just being able to do what they did in the month of April, especially starting on the road on the West Coast to be sitting at 16 and 13 on a day off is pretty special. Yeah, we still haven't seen, as you mentioned, Vaughn Grissom in a Red Sox uniform yet in a regular season game as he works his way back from an injury. But as you said, it's remarkable. I, I, I Nobody's going to throw a parade for 16 and 13. But at the same time, with the expectations coming into this season, this is a strong start for a team that has been hit so hard on the injury front. And the reason that they've been so good is you and I have talked about week in, week out has been the pitching best ERA in major league baseball from just a team perspective and on the starting side. And, and one guy, Dan, uh, along with Cutter Crawford, that has really stood out has been Tanner Houck and the jump he's made this year production wise on the mound. He's turned himself at least through the first month of the season as one of the best pitchers in baseball. Yeah. You know, it's kind of cool to watch. It reminds me of a lot of different stories from a confidence perspective. And I think when they brought in Andrew Bailey and Justin Willard, it, it matched perfectly. And Craig Breslow matched perfectly what Tanner Houck wanted to become as far as how he became a major league pitcher. So I think he was ready to blossom and that type of coaching puts it together. It's almost like Josh McDaniels joining a Mac Jones, or it's almost like, you know, Cam Neely coming to the Bruins organization years ago and just having Harry Sindon say, you just worry about putting the puck in the net. You know, those kind of things where that confidence grows because it's simple instruction. This is how we're going to attack. And then Tanner Houck steps up to that next level and takes it himself. And right now through the month of April, Joe, and, and things could change. But right now he's on a Pedro Martinez like level as far as what he's been able to accomplish just pitching. And it's been pretty cool to watch. It's just it's so efficient. You know, we heard the term Maddox. We had that Maddox outing a couple of weeks ago. And it's just kind of one of those cool things that you're like, that's what baseball should be about. That's the perfect match, and it's worked out perfectly for Tanner Houck and the Red Sox. And I'm glad you brought up Pedro Martinez because I think when you brought up that name, some people watching this may be, oh, come on, Dan, you got to be kidding me. However, Houck is now registered back-to-back -back starts of nine-plus strikeouts and no walks. He joins Pedro and a guy named Roger Clemens as the only Red Sox pitchers to notch that particular achievement. So back-to-back -back starts of nine-plus strikeouts and uh, going uh, uh, and, and just dominating in, out there on the mound. I'm go I, Until further notice, I think we should be dubbing Tanner Houck starts Houck days. You know how we had sale days and obviously back in the day, Pedro Martinez days. He's been that fun to watch, and again, it's only one month through the season, but I think in just watching him, it doesn't feel like a fluke. And I think we could be doing this until further proven wrong. He, he's been that good. I've, I, I, it's, it's appointment viewing when he's on the mound right now. Yeah, and I think that ties also in with that confidence word. It's my favorite word to use in sports because they can go hand in hand. When you get the stuff, when you get the right coaching, when you get put in the right position, the confidence just grows and grows and grows, right? So that's what you hope that this April did for him, that maybe he goes out to the, to the mound now with – no Lucas Giolito with no Nick Pavetta for now. And maybe he's considered the ace of this staff. Maybe he takes that next step. Maybe his confidence grows because let's face it. You've been around all these athletes. They, they, they look on the outside, like they're the most secure and confident people in the world, but they're human. They go through stretches where it just, you know, and, and how it certainly hasn't been an easy, you know, transition to get him to a starting pitcher. So I think maybe he grows and takes that next step, Joe. So I, I like Jonathan Papelbon was on, Social media last night with a Hulkamania t-shirt as, as he was showing that off too. So 
yeah, why not? I mean, you're looking for ways to have fun at Fenway Park because it was doom and gloom coming in for so many people. Sure, I think it's just time to celebrate baseball. The warm weather's here now, uh, at least for a day, and it's starting to get to get nice. <laughs> so maybe maybe that next step goes for how can maybe everybody rides that as well. And I think the whole team can be set for that too, right? Everybody telling you, no, you can't do this. No, you're getting all these injuries. No, you're not good enough. And all of a sudden, we're seeing Willier Abreu and guys that you wouldn't expect to really blossom that quickly have really stepped up when the Red Sox needed it. And it's been fun to watch. It really has. And just a couple more notes on how his first pitch strike rate, it's roughly at 65%, his walk rate at 3.2%. And that's the fifth best in the sport, his career mark at 8.1. So he's well below what he'd done previously. And he's put the ball yep. in the zone. And, and he's let been me stop you there, Joe, because that's huge for a guy right. like him with throwing different pitches, that change of speeds and what have you. That was it, eighty-five percent uh, as far as first pitch strike. Sixty-five percent, uh, but it's 65%. that's top forty in baseball. Yes, yeah, it's huge, right? For no. a guy like that, beat me. I, I, you know, I'm going to throw strikes. You beat me. Not, I'm going to walk guys and nibble around and things like that. He's going right after them because he's got such good stuff, and he's got like that heavy ball, which can cause broken bats and ground balls, and that's like Derek Lowe. You know, Jason Veritek told me when when Lowe was struggling and things like that, he would simply go to Derek Lowe and say, "Listen." I'm going to put my glove up. I want you to hit it every time. Just throw your natural throwing motion. And his ball was so, had such good natural movement on it. That that's all he needed to do. And that's the kind of when he got into a zone, it was special to watch. So maybe something like that's occurring too. And Tanner Houck, in the years we've watched him in the past, and it, it you could the stuff was always there. It was just about how can he harness it and put it all together. And he's certainly done that. The first round pick of the Red Sox in 2017. He's he's been so much fun to watch. And you talk about what Craig Breslow's done and, and the pitching infrastructure now within this organization. You mentioned the the other name is Justin Willard and of course Andrew Bailey. Let's give him some props on another move he made in the offseason, and that's acquiring Tyler O'Neill. Dan. They traded two guys, Nick Robertson and Victor Santos, to get him. And two guys that you just say, all right, goodbye. Uh, you know, not not impact guys that the Red Sox had within their organization. You get this middle of the lineup bat who really since the moment he's been put on this roster has done nothing but hit. Yeah, and I think that's kind of, to me, that was probably a sit down with Cora, right, in spring training and say, listen, I know you've had some injuries. You've been battling those, but when you're good, you can be really good. So just go out and do what you do. And we've seen him battle injuries already, Joe. That's to me, that's the one biggest factor with Tyler O'Neill. But if you can get him in there, especially now with Costas on the shelf and story gone, you need help with him and Raphael Devers. If they can become that three, four type of duo, then that's a huge step. So yes, just keep him upright, keep him healthy and let him do what he does. And he's certainly a pretty special hitter. They're going to pitch around him. They're going to throw, you know, different off-speed stuff. We'll see that adjustment from American League pitchers especially. But the way he's progressing and the way he's doing things, it's pretty cool. Yeah, he had the walk-off hit on Sunday against the Cubs. He also had two home runs during the homestand. I'm pretty sure he could bench press me 40 times, too, with uh, <laughs> how big a guy he is. With one arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got he's got some big biceps with that dad, probably quadruple mine, if, if if that, probably even more. But you know, you you add him to the mix offensively. Now Rafi Devers is starting to come around as well. Ten for his last twenty at the plate. And you mentioned William Abreu, and this is a guy got off to a slow start this season, but last fifteen games he's hitting three fifty two, and he's got an OPS above a thousand. You talk about a guy that's starting to find himself a little bit here at the big league level, and and he's had a huge huge imp impact for them offensively, but he's also made some nice plays defensively too. Yeah, that catch he made in, in right field on Sunday night was pretty special. I'm yeah. sure he's hurting today because he hit, went into the uh, went into the wall pretty strong. Uh, the other part of that too is I go back to Alex Cora, right? You know, when you're struggling that much on that West Coast, or he might have been tempted to, to sit him down for a while, let him gather his thoughts or what have you, but to throw him back out there, a lot of it was necessity, right? But uh, just showing the confidence in a guy like, uh, him can help him now. And now he's growing in that confidence too. And I think, again, that'll be my theme all day here, Joe, is that just when you're on a team, when you're not supposed to do anything and everybody else around you starts doing things, it picks everybody else up. And I think maybe that's how they feel collectively as a team right now. Because the one thing that I was assured of coming out of spring training, it was a good group. They were a good group of guys, even though the talent wasn't necessarily what they wanted it to be. Uh, I, I, uh, as far as, you know, they needed two more starting pitches. We've been down that road, but I think as a group, they were on the same page 
like each other, get along with each other, and had a strong resolve coming out of spring training. And now you're starting to see that grow too. So again, it's one month, but you know, things like that, we've been doing this a long time, you know, it, it can happen, which, which is really cool. Yeah. And especially with the record so far, again, three games above 500 coming up into this series against the giants. One more thing before we let you go, just uh, wanted to end this with a, with a, a grander major Wait, league. Can I, base. can I add one more thing before yes. we get to the fun yes. stuff with the uniforms? Yes. It, 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 let me just say this. If I am Tom Warner, John Henry, Craig Breslow and Sam Kennedy, it's May, right around May 1st. I just quickly do a study. What are the top five managerial ser- ser- uh, salaries in baseball at the average of? And I call Alex Cora into my office or into the suite, what have you. Today would be a perfect day or Monday, rather, should be a perfect day with an off day. And just say, listen, Alex, you know, we, we look at what you do. We know that you won a World Series. We know that you're in the category of the best managers in the game. Here's a five-year deal at the average of the top five salaries in baseball, we want to secure you as a man that's in Boston for a long time to lead this organization from a managerial standpoint. And I think right now would be the perfect time to send messages all throughout baseball, all throughout that organization and say, this is our guy for years to come, right? Because I think he deserves that status of a Bruce Bochy, uh, you know, a Joe Torre when he was in his prime too. You're not going to get any better. I'm sorry. You're not going to get much better than Alex Cora in Boston in that match with a tough place to manage than you have right now. So I would secure him. And if he turns it down, so be it. Right. But at least I would say we made an attempt at a five year average top five salary to Alex Cora. And you go from there. I I couldn't agree with you more, What he's already done with this team. And Dan, I always think about in the, and there were a lot of articles in the off season about this. If, if the Red Sox don't end up re-signing him, Who's the team that you think is looming out there the most? It's the Los Angeles Dodgers. If they don't get it done again this year, you, oh, you could be a, the New York Yankees. Or Joe, could right? be the New York right? Yankees. It could be with Aaron Boone. Like, yeah. we, we've seen him on thin ice too. So, yeah, I mean, he's not going to just sit there, you know, and sit out a season or whatever. He's going to be right back in a dugout with a high profile, high payroll team right away. I agree with you. I, I, I couldn't. Yeah. I, I, I think that that is one of the most important things that the Red Sox can take care of this year is a guy like Alex Cora, because he's also somebody, you know, as well. And, and, and as you mentioned, top five manager in the game, that's pretty much a consensus thought as well. And you don't know, you know, you might be interested in who else is out there, but it could be a lot worse. And we, look around major league baseball when we look at managers and, and sometimes mock them for what they do. You don't have a guy like that here in, in Boston and Alex Cora. So I, I couldn't be in agree with, with you more. Yeah. So, and I, I think, yeah, I agree. And you look at it too, is I go back to what Bochi did last year in that world series with Texas in postseason. That's it's, it's more important than anything else to find the right guys to tap, to, to, to move guys up and down in the lineup. Who's going to start, what start is going to come out of the bullpen. We've seen, Alex Cora do that in 2018. So it's proof of that, right? He yeah. does that. We've seen Bruce Bochy do that, right? So that, that's what makes a top manager one of the best in the game, the ability to do it when it matters most. It's like Belichick in a Super Bowl. It's having that ability to, to, to calm things down and do what's right and find your strategy to win games. He has that, plus Boston, which isn't easy. Plus he likes it here and has loved it here. Uh, so, you know, again, I think it's a no-brainer. I, I couldn't agree with you more. All right, final thing before we let you go here, Dan. Major League Baseball rectifying one of the biggest mistakes that they've made this year, and that is the jerseys and pants. I, I just would like our viewers to think about if Dan Roach, when he was doing his sports cast or he was out in the field, was contractually required to wear a suit that was way too uh, tight on him and maybe could see through the pants legs. But uh, with the Major League Baseball in, in the jerseys, it's something that's been a complaint about uh, from all the players Thankfully, ESPN released an article over the weekend saying that, according to a memo, the prominent modifications for the jerseys include making larger lettering again on the back and then re- uh, remedying mitch- mismatched gray tops and bottoms and addressing the new Nike jersey's propensity to collect sweat. So those are a couple of things that will be rectified. I can't believe we have to talk about this, but it was the talk of baseball coming into the season when they unveiled these new jerseys in spring training. At least we know now that they're going to change back to what they were. Well, one thing, right, if I had that suit that you described, the record numbers of viewers clicking off (laughs) WBC Channel 4 would be amazing because nobody would want to see that. Second of all, I just think it's like, hey, um, 
you know, almost like, all right, did Major League Baseball just take a money grab, right? Because yep. it's just like, what happened, right? It, you're, you're a big league professional business, and you had these issues coming into spring training. Somebody screwed up along the way. And just then go back to it and replicate what Majestic did and the, the people that had the uniforms before and make them the same. Everybody loved them. Yeah. Everybody, the players loved them. There was never, we never heard complaints about uniforms ever. When was the last time you heard somebody complain about a uniform in, in, in big league baseball until this off season? So just fix it. They should have done it a long time ago. Get it right and move on. Yeah. Yeah. If it ain't broke, why fix it? And and, and thankfully, Major League Baseball is fixing something that was broken this year. Uh, they did say that uh, the article from ESPN saying the changes which will happen at the latest by the beginning of the 2025 season will include fixes to the pants as well, too. So it could happen in 2025 or maybe a little bit earlier. Then, regard- then we can have a Chris Sale day to open up the season next year. Right. <laughs> Everybody gets scissors. And they can just <laughs> yeah. do what they want to do and cut up the uniform, shred the uniforms at their will, <laughs> the old ones. Right. You should do a sports cast like that. <laughs> In the old uni? No, it yeah. wouldn't look good. <laughs> Dan, appreciate the time as always. I know you got a lot of Bruins and Celtics coverage coming up this week for us and for our viewers, but thanks for the time as always. Always love ch- uh, talking socks with you and glad that we will get to see some new jerseys in the not too distant future. Have a great week, young man.